to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly podcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And like usual, no Robert. Of course, I think that's the running joke of the show. So <laughs> we get t-shirts made to say, welcome to Six Strings and Things, no Robert. Yes, that's right. We should get t-shirts. And that way we'll, it's like yes. all about the bass, no treble. It's like all about the guitar, no Robert. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, if you like to hear our show and you enjoy listening to our podcasts and you like to think really hard about what we say and say, hmm, I found that useful, please like our video, subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you and suggest some other topics. Otherwise, you're just going to get Chris and Jesse chatting about guitar, which probably should be the name, name of the show. That would guitar, be cool. Guitar Chat with Chris and Jesse. <laughs> We'd have to have that smooth radio voice. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, you want the deep radio voice or do you want the, the kind of easy listening like the Delilah? Oh, Guitar yes. Guitar chat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be great. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Guitar Chat. <laughs> Okay, so I hope we haven't lost uh, <laughs> And three quarters of our listeners have just stopped. <laughs> <laughs> All three of them. <laughs> yep. uh, my mom's probably still listening. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, Jesse, what have you been working on this week? All right. Um, a little bit of uh, throwback to the 80s stuff, of course. Uh, some Randy Rhodes uh, stuff uh, over the mountain. Has a nice, you know, cool rhythm to it, you know, and uh, didn't get too far with the solo, but. I just get distracted and make up my own as I go. <laughs> so, I think his mom passed away this week. I, that was one of the dates. I was going to, yes, she did on the 11th. Sorry to steal your thunder. It's on the quite all right. November 11th, Dolores Rhodes. So this was a mom of uh, Randy Rhodes and she owned a music store in, um, I think Burbank out there in Salt Lake, sunny, Southern California. Um, at which Randy taught for a while before leaving for bigger and better things with Ozzy and quiet riot. But yeah, there we go. So I'll, I'll let you tell what you were doing on guitar, or do you want me to throw out the dates and then we can uh, do that? <laughs> Let's throw out the dates. Let's mix it up a little bit. I know, like you know, our longtime listeners, all, all two of them, are expecting you know me to go next. But why don't we just mix Ooh, it up? Ooh, here we go. Something That's new, right? Yes, go for it. So uh, James Young, November fourteenth, nineteen forty nine. So. Uh, oh, guitar player. One of the guitar players for Sticks, kind of the kind of rock and roll guy. Um, Kirk Hammett of Metallica fame, uh, November 18th, 1962. Dwayne Allman, um, November 20th, 1946. Joe Walsh of the Eagles and also some wacky solo <laughs> work. Uh, November 20th, also 1946. Stephen Van Zandt um, from the E Street Band, uh, the 22nd. Um, Hendrix, of course, is coming up on the 27th of November, 1942. Um, we talk about Hendrix all the time. So uh, here's one that uh, is kind of a little more obscure. Steve Rothery. I don't know if you've ever heard of the band Marillion. No. No? no? Um, Br British, I think Scottish. I, some of the guys were Scottish. Uh, the, the one singer named Fish, the original singer, was, uh, I think, Scottish. Um, interesting prog rock stuff. Not quite as like out there as like Genesis, you know, the early Genesis stuff, but kind of neat. And they had some really cool stuff. I really love their stuff. Anyway, November 25th, uh, 1959. So um, not a monster player, but very good, very, um, you know, technically competent and fit the songs really well. So that's the most birthday dates we've had in one show yet. Yes, that's, that's a record. Uh <laughs> It's a record for this episode. I don't even know. What episode are we on, by the way? Uh, 30? 30. <gasps> 30? Oh, we should have had a big celebratory show. Yeah, is this like that copper anniversary show anniversary? Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. Actually, it's guitar, so it should be the nickel show anniversary. The nickel, yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> the nickel rap. <laughs> So, Chris, what have you been doing? <laughs> so, okay, so before I get into what I've been doing, I've got two things off of the birth. Well, no, one thing off of the birthday thing. I think it's a, kind of amazing that we haven't heard the, like the big news that Metallica players are fifty or over fifty. Mm. 
You know, I think that's saying something about sort of our, our culture, our listening habits, you know, the Rolling Stones or they're well past 50. And right. that was, I remember when they turned 50, that was sort of like a thing. Yeah, you know, that's right. true. But Metallica, you, you, you haven't heard about that, you know, and he's he's 53, I guess now. Yeah. So, well, I'll uh, say, though, yeah, there isn't quite the um, kind of 60s based distrust of older people, you know, like don't trust anybody over 30 as, it's, right. as it was back in the 60s. Right. And uh, and you had lyrics like right from Pete Townsend and, and, and uh, you know, the who with uh, the hope I die before I get old and, and whatever. And so when they get old <laughs> and they're still singing that, it's kind of a different thing. Metallica never really. You know, they certainly spoke to people of their age group when they were younger, but it's not really a in your face to older people. Right. It's just right. in your face to everybody. <laughs> right. Right. And, so, and the other thing I have, and this is unfortunately not going to mean a whole lot to our, our, our listeners on audio only, but I have to ask, what is that guitar to your left behind you? This one. Yes. This, yes. this is the new eBay thing that was going to come up. Oh, OK. Well, then I will – Okay. Hold off there. All right. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. We will hold off there and then we will we'll come back. So I have, I believe, gotten over my motivation hump. Wonderful. And, yes. And uh, I did it by working on a new song, ah, a new old song, actually, I should say, because I played the first – I never played the first few bars of this song before and I decided it was time to go back to it. Um, and it's uh, Good Times, Bad Times. Uh, mm-hmm. What is that one version? Yep. The original version, right? Yeah, the right. good one. And uh, there's several other versions out there. Godsmack actually has a pretty good one too. Mm. But um, yeah, so I'm all the way up to the solo, and I don't think there's a snowball's chance in Hades I'm going to pull that off. <laughs> because I was looking at the tab. My mom gave me a Led Zeppelin tab book for my birthday a while back. And uh, so thanks, mom, if you're listening. And uh, going through good times, bad times, and all of a sudden I see these 30 second notes in the tab. And I'm like, uh oh. So I listen to it again, like the solo more closely. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. So I think what I'm going to do is just sort of uh, make up a blues and E to play along with a blues <laughs> pentatonic scale and E. That always and works. Go through it and then just pick up, you know. But actually, there's not much to pick up after that's done because the solo is pretty darn near the end of the song. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I feel pretty solid about the first, say, minute and a half of the song, which mm-hmm. is a good chunk of the song. Right. And, you know, hit the solo and we'll see what comes of that. But I think what I'm going to do is try to focus on what's the what's being done. You know, are there arpeggios here? Is it basically just blues licks or blues runs or whatever? Mm-hmm. And a lot of it I recognize because I've played those kinds of things before. And what's really cool, at least for me, is there's parts of good times, bad times I recognize from over the hills and far away. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of pull off hammer on kind of things that he does in both songs. Yeah. And I recognize, Oh, that's like that or whatever. So that was kind of cool. So I've been working on that. I've been working on rhythm. I need to work on my rhythm a lot. Uh, something I always just need to push forward with and trying to get out of uh, this sort of program swing that I have when I play mm-hmm. from playing sort of a blue shuffle all the sure. time. Oh yeah. And you know, I work with my instructor and he's like, all right, let's do this eighth notes. And I just can't not do the swing. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I'm okay not doing it while I'm at home as long as I'm doing certain strumming patterns. But you know, we were working on a couple of songs, just rhythm parts of songs and I was just defaulting back to the swing. So I'm going to go all the way back, take my metronome down to about around about 110 beats per minute, maybe even 90 beats per minute, right. and just do quarter notes and then eighth notes. And I think I'm going to try to find a, a metronome app that does the, uh, a light on the off beat. So a lot of okay. them do light, light up on the, uh, on, right. on the beat. I think I'm going to try to find one that lights up on the offbeat. That way I can sort of visually and sort of with my ears hear that and try to get that down. Because it's very possible at home when I'm practicing, I'm so used to hearing the swing that I'm doing the swing where it's sort of like two thirds, one third kind of, yeah. you know, distribution of, um, it's almost like triplets in the interval, except that's not really a triplet. It's, it's the, the, the vision is, Yes, yeah, I know what and, you're talking about. Yeah, so I need to break that. I got to deprogram myself and then reprogram myself so that I can do both. Yeah, you know, on demand. Uh, so I've been working on that, some rhythm patterns. Um, 
Oh, I should give a shout out while I'm talking about good times, bad times. Papa Stash's video is awesome on good times, bad times. <laughs> He's got some good stuff. I like, yeah, I like his style. He does. So uh, I don't know if Papa Stash listens to our show. Probably not. He's probably too busy making cool videos. Right. But if you are listening to our show, keep up the good work, Papa Stash, because that's some good stuff there. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah. I have a question with your uh, with the kind of dotted eighth, you know, swinging a feel. Do mm-hmm. you uh, is that the way you play when you're a single note, or are we talking just rhythm stuff? Well, that's it's a good question. So my instructor, I just had my my lesson yesterday, and my instructor said, "Play me a major scale A, All right? Major scale A. All right, mm-hmm. okay, no problem. It's not there. Okay." Yeah, and I think I know why, because my previous instructor had really worked hard to train me into playing scales with a metronome, mm-hmm. going quarter notes, then eighth notes, then sixteenth notes. Right. And so I think I don't have that when I'm playing scales. Now mm-hmm. the question is, am I doing it when I'm playing improvising? I don't know. I didn't think to check, so <laughs> we'll yeah, have, have to pay attention to that. I know, I know. I, I have to uh, listen more carefully when I'm playing, and my guess is I do. That's my guess. Yeah. Well, the reason I asked was I, I was thinking if you do the same thing when you're doing scales, it might be interesting to start like with your major scale instead of starting on a downstroke, start with an upstroke and see if it still pans out that way or if you settle into like a straight eight you know, sort of feel. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and when I'm doing uh, certain strumming patterns, um, you know, this is the classic rock strumming pattern, down, down, up, up, down, up, mm-hmm. right? I can do that, no problem with the metronome. It's not swinging. It's when I'm really thinking about doing stuff with upstrokes or okay. that's where I really hit that swing kind of thing or I'm raking or that kind of stuff. And I just need to – I just need to get to eights, and because uh, that you know that opens up a lot of classic rock is eighth note rhythm. Yeah, right. And so that would open up all that to me a bit easier than what I'm doing now. But you know, for the last four and a half years, though, my ear and my hands have been programmed to that swing. Yeah. And so when he's telling me I'm doing it, I don't even realize I'm doing it. You know that's true, and that I think that's the way a lot of people. I think that's human nature. Mm-hmm. You know, you get things so ingrained that uh, your style becomes as much what you don't or can't or whatever do is is what you do. And that's like you, you were saying about uh, you know Pagey doing similar stuff in different songs. And uh, and you know when I was doing that Troy Grady, like looking at the when he took apart all the eighties like thrash or not thrash, but uh, hair metal, the speedster, you know, speed demons. Um, they had the same kind of thing too. I mean, at the time you go through and say, I, I can't even begin to play that fast or that clean or whatever. And so you don't look deep enough to see the repetitiveness of the licks that they do. But I mean, like Malmsteen and Gilbert, and they all have their favorite stuff. I mean, it might be more right. complicated than like BB's, you know, BB's box, you know, or, or right. Clapton's licks that he has played a bunch of times. But they do, they have their own that you'll hear again and again. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's hard to break out of whatever we do once it's ingrained. Because you have to ingrain it to get the muscle memory to where yeah. you do it like so quickly or whatever, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually using it as an opportunity to, to really crack down on my alternate picking, which I think my alternate picking is generally fine if a little sloppy. Mm-hmm. But with uh, as fast as that solo is, you have to have it nailed down. Yeah, And so I'm really analyzing, you know, each note and what's the best pick attack, what's the best direction to pick attack mm-hmm. for the alternate picking and making sure that I, I – because some of it you just can't play if you're not alternate picking. And I'm, I'm kind of convinced of it that it's almost almost to the point of sweet picking. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah. Some of it. Yeah. I mean it's not – it's probably not sweet picking like the 80s metals guy, metal guys do, right? Right. But it's, it's probably pretty close. Yeah. I mean there's some economy picking that, you know, even before the sweet picking got really – popular that it just kind of fell into the hands that way and if jimmy played it a bunch of times i mean it'll just get faster and if like you say if it's well designed sort of way of doing it then it's, it's going to be able to be that much faster though he never struck me as like the most clean or technical of the i mean i, I don't know i bet when you get this a little bit more you know into it it'll come under your fingers where you'll be like yeah i guess i could play it that fast yeah maybe because i'm thinking they're not going to be intervals that are crazy to play 
No, they're not. And a lot of it, at least the first bar of the solo, is sort of a standard blues pentatonic lick where right. you do a full step bend on the G string with your third finger mm-hmm. and then rock that first finger back on um, the B and E, mm-hmm. uh, the top strings of the first pentatonic scale, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so if you're doing it playing an E, um, the first finger would be on B and E, the 12th frets. Okay. B and e. So take the 14th fret, bend it up, and then take your first finger and go right back. I think of it as rocking back sort of on that that B and E um, string. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of that. Um, it's not much movement. In that. It's fast, but there's not much movement out of that box mm-hmm. um, in the first bar. And then at some point, he comes up to like the 20th fret on the uh, – on the B string, which is just crazy on my telly because it's not, I'm still getting used to playing with the guitar on my right leg. Oh yeah. Which I'm liking. I'm liking far better than the way I used to play with my guitar over my left leg. Really? But yes. Oh yes. Cause I was yes. paying attention to that. And it's like, and how do I play? Cause you know, I don't pay attention. It's like, and I'm pretty much on my left leg most of the time. Yeah. And it's like, and I tried on the right and it's like, yeah, not for me. <laughs> Well, you know, the thing is, is my shoulder has to get used to it because my arm mm. is is strumming further back, but it it's feeling like a more relaxed position for me. Yeah. But the one danger I've noticed is that I have a tendency of resting my left forearm on my left leg. Oh yeah. Because the guitar neck's right there, and I'm always you know stop that because it, it kills your speed. Oh yeah. You know. Uh, just and, lazy. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's too it's, much work to hold that left arm up. <laughs> and it's harder to access those high frets. Yeah. Um, but I'm starting to learn it. I'm starting to get comfortable with it. And my instructor tells me that when he watches me play now, I look a lot more relaxed and my posture is better. Right. And he just seems like he says it looked more comfortable. And I said, well, I never felt uncomfortable with the guitar on my left leg. Mm-hmm. But then again, I didn't know anything else. Right. Right. Maybe that's just become so ingrained because that's how it was with me. Right. And, you know, once you do something for a few years, I mean, that's what's comfortable. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like, that's interesting. But I can tell you this. So uh, I've had a little bit of problem with the old carpal tunnel. Oh, really? At, over the last couple of years. And uh, I have less problems when I'm playing over my right leg. See, that's how I was. That's how I was playing before. So our our audience on um, <laughs> on audio, audio where I'm, yeah. I have the guitar and I'm tra- uh, changing legs, and this is how I always play it. And this feels twisted to me. Yeah. Now, for just chugging along, you know, for like you know, that's it's very comfortable on the right leg, and it's almost sure. more of a standing sort of feel to it. And this is more of a, okay, I'm working over the fretboard when it's on the left leg. Right. Um, and that's, this is normally how I would sit with it. I'm telling you, try, try my strap. It feels like butter. Yeah. On your right leg. Have yeah. To do that. It just, it's like, this is where it belongs. Right. Uh, I, I might switch between them. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a weird thing. Now I have to uh, do a study. And yeah. uh, get a well, spreadsheet. How many times I've... I'm thinking my SG is going to be a, a, a right leg guitar anyway. Right. Well, the balance things we, we mentioned that before yep. are definitely uh, yeah. You have more control because there's more there in front of you, and that's where the weight is. And an SG is kind of more toward the neck. Yeah, and I'm still getting used to the Les Paul on the on the right leg. That would freak me out. The real Les Paul on the right because it feels like it just wants to go bloop, fall off the right. end. <laughs> It's a little weird. It's a little weird, but so you uh, just need a nice uh, a weight to clamp on the headstock. As the last <laughs> they used to make these brass things that you would glue or clamp onto the headstock called fat heads, and the whole idea in the eighties was sustain and mass equals sustain. And so the more weight you could put on, of course, people had these huge, heavy maple guitars with, I guess, fat heads on them. Yeah, and uh, of course, you know these things with as with anything, you know. You get fads, and that went right. away, and now people play lighter guitars and whatever. Speaking of guitars, yes. So for those on video, I am now holding up in front of the camera a, a white Steinberger Spirit guitar. Um, 
and I'll describe it to the people who are on audio only. So uh, there is no headstock on this, totally headstock less. Uh, 24 full frets, and for the most part, it's a full scale length guitar. I think it's about like a Gibson length uh, scale, so 24 and three quarters ish. Um, and then the uh, the body end of the guitar, there's a tremolo unit. I don't have the bar on it right now, and it pretty much terminates very near the end of the guitar. Okay, so there's as little space as you can kind of have with uh, uh, a guitar with pickups and electronics and, and a bridge, um, and not much else. It has a little swing out leg rest so that uh, because if you, if you can see this guitar and actually go Google, I'll put a link up to, uh, to uh, Steinberger uh, Spirit so that you can see what it looks like. It's very square. It's like almost a Bo Diddley box, you know, <laughs> it's like a V without the little prongs. Yeah, you could. Do, and actually, yeah. they, they've made V versions okay because they're kind of halfway there anyway right um, but it, they made it pretty small and then they have a little fold out leg thing that allows it to just kind of rest on your on your leg it's actually pretty ingenious uh, the whole idea is it's a travel guitar that gives you full um a full scale instrument full pickup selection and everything but at a size pretty close to what those mini guitars you know that you can buy for 100 bucks are yep. but what's nice is the fret uh, distances are normal you know, they're not like, you know, the frets uh, are very close together in those little practice guitars. Right. Now, I do have an extra. Typically, you get these and they need special strings that have balls on both ends. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Okay. So they're sized for uh, you just drop them into the bridge and then you drop it into the, to the end and there you go. Um, I haven't even priced those kind of strings. I, I'm imagining just because of the limited market that would be more expensive. But there is an adapter that I have. Um, that allows you to just thread the string through, tighten it down with a uh, Allen wrench, and then clip it off. Oh yeah. Um, these are all over eBay. They typically go like forty bucks, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but for a little piece of aluminum, you know, <laughs> um, I think I got mine for a little less than that, but I can't remember. It depends. So because um, I've had this one. So this is my second of these, you know, and there are great travel guitars, one to leave at work, one to leave at the parents' house, always have a guitar available. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Just in case you're bored with whatever the conversation is. <laughs> That's right. So It's like that bumper sticker, I'd rather be playing guitar. <laughs> exactly. And this one, I think I uh, went over the, uh, the eBay adventure where I actually was shipped a BB gun, but the guy came through and, and uh, shipped the guitar and it's in good shape. And there we go. Been having, nice. having fun with that. That is cool. Yeah, very handy to, to to have something like that, especially at work. You know, the in between hours of things going on or whatever. Yeah. You, could, you know, you could mindlessly surf the web, or you could mindlessly strum some chords, and you're probably better off doing with the, the chords. chords. Yeah, yep. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that is cool. Well, congratulations on the good score. Woohoo! I'm glad you were able to return the BB gun. <laughs> I love toys. That's true. <laughs> Well, now I wonder. That must have been fun, too, that BB gun. <laughs> yeah, it probably would be fun. Yeah. I had to wonder, the guy that received the guitar is like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, he must have. I don't know. I mean, I'd be like, oh, this would be cool if you were a guitar player. So yeah. I have to assume he wasn't. Yeah. But I was interested in the BB gun, for sure. Yeah. And I think, why that BB gun would be fun? But then I think, you know, BB guns are almost never really a good idea in the hands of a boy. Because they just cause destruction. And when you get one that actually spews out however many rounds per second this thing did, it's yeah. never going to be a good idea. Yeah, I shouldn't get my hands on that for sure. <laughs> it's just trouble. It's just trouble. So. All right. Well, we don't have a BB gun podcast. Uh, so I'm certainly not qualified to host one of those. Uh, me neither. Yeah, I know very little about them. But um, anyhow, I think that's about all for the show. I don't know, unless you have something else to talk about. That's pretty good. All right. Well, it's a short one today, folks. But, uh, you know, if you'd like a longer show, email us and say, hey, we'd love to have your thoughts on blank, which is guitar related. Uh, Or tweet us at SST Show. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, You can email me, Chris, at JesterCat.com. You can check out the show at JesterCat.com. And uh, like I said, we'd love to hear from you. So. For uh, Jesse and myself, just keep picking and grinning. Good night. 
Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 